Today, we're looking at a story today that is the longest conversation, one-on-one conversation recorded uh, with Jesus. So Jesus is a one-on-one conversation with another person. So it's the longest one. So it ought to cause us to, to, to listen up uh, as we read it. So uh, the text is John 4. Uh, Jenna has it for us. John 4, 21 through 24. Let's read it together. And excuse me, I have different translations. I'll just read this one. All right. Uh, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's pray together. Holy God, we humble ourselves before you. We admit that we cannot follow you without you, and we can't understand your word without you. We admit that we need your help. And we ask uh, that you guide me today and help us all uh, to hear what you have to say to each person here, as if you were, if we're the only person in here, you speaking straight to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you uh, don't need to be a social scientist to understand that in our look at our society or even at the world at, at whole that there is a lot of pain, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of brokenness, broken families, uh, broken marriages. We see a lot of brokenness in general. Uh, we see a lot of addictions. We see addictions to drugs. We see addictions to, to games even. Uh, things that, uh, that just rob us of the life that God intended us for us to have. We see uh, thirst. That's what we can say. We see a lot of thirst, or you might say hunger, uh, because uh, a lot of times we're seeking God in the wrong, the wrong places. Uh, we were meant to be satisfied and to find our fullness and completeness in him, find the meaning of life in him, but too often we seek him in the wrong places. So in the world, uh, especially those that aren't following Christ, we see a lot of depravity, uh, through self, we see selfishness, self-centeredness, um, arrogance, pride, um, all for, for a lack of a, a relationship, a close walk with the Lord. Uh, we see a need, not just for uh, thirst, not just for spiritual thirst, but maybe you would even say a need that stemmed from that, a need for attention. Needing attention uh, from other people, doing things, maybe trading your good morals for just a little bit of attention. And that could be even through a, saying a, a crude joke or whatever it, it may be. Um, or it could be something on a larger scale um, that the whole, if you're a student, the whole school knows about it. Um, we may trade our good morals just for a little bit of attention. Um, so we are in a need of attention, but I'm not here today really to say that attention uh, is a bad thing. Uh, the need for attention, to receive attention, is a bad thing. But I'm talking about a, the need to give attention. To give our attention to God. To give our worship to Him. Uh, to give Him uh, His due praise. And in, in doing that, finding what we are really meant to do, what life is really all about, as we are allowing Him to transform us as, as we praise Him, as we worship Him, as He created us to do so. Uh, so why is there so much thirst in the world? That's it, because uh, there's no true, true worship. Uh, true worship, if there's no true worship, then there must be a thing called false uh, worship. There's not enough right attention given to God, too much attention given to little gods, uh, little things uh, that were created that are not the creator. Uh, so Jesus says uh, to us, that the Father, he's going out, and it's like he's seeking, almost like he's scanning the earth. Uh, he's searching for true worshipers, searching for true worshipers. And like I said, if, it, if there's such thing as true worship, then of course there's a, a, a something called false worship. Now, whether you believe you're a worshiper or not, 
everyone is a worshiper. Uh, you just might not be worshiping God. Uh, the, the definition of worship is really to give uh, or to treat things or even people, uh, treat things or people with that which you're supposed to give to God. That's pretty plain and simple. Your acts of devotion. You give them, uh, you treat things like they're gods, like the God, uh, and you give them your acts and devotion. So we, if we want to really figure out if there's an idol, a small God in my life that's robbing me from spiritual thirst and abundant life, just look at the things that you give the most devotion to, the most attention that you give. Uh, that'll tell you, and that'll be your cure, uh, for, or at least to get at least one of, one of those idols out of your heart. Uh, but whether, you, like I said, everyone is a worshiper. Uh, now, people may scoff at that, uh, especially non-believers. They say, well, how can I be a worshiper? Like, well, like I said, if you're given devotion to something that isn't God, but you might say, well, I'm not, I don't believe in God. There's no such thing as God. Uh, well, it, like, the, the definition doesn't say to, tr- to recognize something as God uh, or to recognize God, but it says to treat something as you would be treating it God, giving it your acts of devotion. Um, so we see, as you can see in our society, there is a lot of thirst because of such, because of false, false worship. And uh, so God is seeking the Father is seeking worse, true worshipers. And remember, or just notice, that the Scripture does not say he's seeking worship. That's interesting. It doesn't say that he's seeking worship as if he needs it. Now, he, he deserves it, of course, and he delights in it. He desires, uh, he, he likes it when we worship him. You want to make God happy? worship him. But the text doesn't say he's looking for worship. It says he's looking for true worshipers. So he's really concerned, not so much about loving himself and hearing how great he is. He knows how great he is, uh, but he's concerned for us knowing. He's concerned for us and our lives being guided uh, and transformed by who he is as we focus on what kind of character, focus on his character, and also in doing so, trusting uh, in his character as we do it. So he doesn't need our, our worship, and God doesn't become any less God if we don't worship him. Now, but we, we could become less human. Human as God in the sense of how God intended us to be. God created us as humans to walk close with God and to be made, how? Yes, thank you, to be made in his image. Uh, not to make him in our image, uh, but to make him, um, to to be made in his image. And that's where we're going to find what true humanity is, uh, learning what God is like so we can follow, and doing that uh, through Christ alone. Uh, So like as we do, if we don't worship God, it doesn't change him one bit, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as scripture declares. But As we do worship him, we are changed, changed more into the likeness he intended for us and to find out what life is really about in Christ. Um, So we see in our text that we do see now that how God really is seeking. Uh, He's seeking those to transform them into true worshipers. Um, As you see, uh, he's even a God that will go out of his way to do so. So as we see... uh, with Jesus, um, in this story, this is the woman at the well, if you haven't realized that yet. Uh, this is the woman at the well, and what's going on, uh, Jesus and his disciples are, are making their way to Jerusalem, uh, which is where the temple is, the temple for the Jews to worship at. And so they're making their way to Jerusalem, uh, but uh, in Samaria, Samaria is kind of in, in the way, like directly in the way. Uh, the fastest way would actually be to go straight through Samaria. Uh, but since there is some rivalry between Jews and Samaritans, uh, most Jews, uh, I would say all of them except for Jesus, uh, went around Samaria. They avoided uh, Samaritans. They avoided uh, Samaria. And, and this hatred, I mean, this is a sin of hatred. 
Uh, and, it's, and it started with, uh, after the Syrian invasion, and what happens is uh, the Samaritans, they, they were Jews, uh, but they intermarried uh, with non-Jews, and that created uh, the Samaritans. And so since then, they, the, the Jews uh, forbid them from using the temple uh, because they, I guess, defiled uh, themselves. They were a defiled race. That's what they would look at them at as. And, uh, I mean, this hatred was so strong uh, that most Jews would pray that they don't even see a Samaritan. They don't want to have that tension uh, build up in seeing one. Uh, and they just didn't want to see one. But also, uh, Pharisees would pray that Samaritans would not be raised in the resurrection. So this is, you know, it kind of shows you how strong uh, this hatred is and this tension. Uh, but as we look um, with Jesus, he doesn't follow the ways of the culture. Now, he might speak the language of the culture, or whatever culture uh, he's speaking to or in, uh, but he doesn't follow the sinful ways of that culture. That was a, they would avoid, that was a sin of, of, of avoiding other people and, and hating them. Uh, God hasn't called anybody to hate, uh, no matter who they are. And so he, Jesus, as we see, he is not dictated by culture, and whatever, however culture uh, is uh, sinning. So, so he goes, and in a way, culturally goes out of his way. Ge- geograf- geographically, it was the fastest way, but he did, he, he, you know, culturally, as a Jew, he went out of his way uh, to meet this woman, to encounter uh, this woman at the well. And so uh, where they're meeting at is a place uh, it's near Mount, what's called Mount, Mount Gerizim. And Mount Gerizim, if, uh, I don't know if you, if you know or not, but that was the place where the Samaritans would worship. So since they got booted out of the, the temple, uh, they, had a, they had to create their own place to worship God. And so it was at Mount, Mount Gerizim. And they did so much out of the rivalry, I think it's mostly out of the rivalry against Jerusalem, and which is actually Mount Zion, um, they've created Mount Gerizim and, and glorified it to say this, was, this is the sacred place to worship. And in the text um, uh, b- before this, uh, the, the woman, uh, oh, I'm sorry, shortly, shortly before this, the woman, will, she'll mention how she says to Jesus, our ancestors uh, worshiped here. And what she's talking about uh, is how the Samaritans said that Abraham, they're saying that Mount Gerizim is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac or attempted or followed God, uh, although he didn't have to go through with it. But they're saying that's the place where yeah, he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. And they say also it was the place where Melchizedek, uh, this mysterious uh, priest-like figure, uh, priest, actually you might say the first priest in Scripture, and some might even say it's, it was Jesus himself, uh, but they say that's where um, Melchizedek met Abraham, and you see the first tithe given. And then uh, they also say that's where Moses built an altar uh, before the people entered into the promised land. And so they, this Mount Gerizim, they really, they really glorified it uh, to make it look like that's the sacred place where we are to worship. So this is where, this is where the conversation takes place. And as I said, Jesus goes out of his way because of God's love in him to meet with this woman, and not so much to get a drink, but to offer, to offer a drink. Um, and we see his heart for the outcast. I mean, God has, we know he has a heart for the, for the lost, but he has a heart for those that are outcasted in the community. And we see it with, with this woman uh, right here, the fact that he goes out of his way uh, to speak with her. And she was certainly a person that was outcasted and mistreated. First of all, she's a Samaritan. Uh, as a Samaritan, she faced Jewish hatred her whole life. She contended with Jewish hatred her whole life. And then secondly, she's what? A woman. Yeah. She's a woman. And back in that culture, uh, women uh, were not treated as equals. Uh, now, the Old Testament uh, holds women in high regard. And it, it says nothing about, I mean, for example, 
You have a mother and father, and we're supposed to honor our who? Mother and father, right? <laughs> uh, it, didn't, it didn't say there was, a, you know, the one was higher, you know, better than the other one. Um, now, there were certainly rules, but there was no way uh, women were to be mistreated as such in this culture. Where I mean, they couldn't even really speak unless, unless spoken to. That's why Jesus, he started the conversation, right? He asked for, he asked for a drink. And so that opened up to where she was able, she was able to speak. Uh, so this woman in particular, she was a Samaritan, and of course she was a woman, but also, I mean, she was rejected. She was not just rejected by the Jews, she was rejected by, they might only guess how many guys? Five. Uh, five guys. Uh, as we see how Je- in Jesus' response in this text, he said how um, it was her five husbands, and it, currently she wasn't married. Um, but in that, we see, um, since you know, a woman's not going to be able to initiate, in that culture, initiate a divorce, so it must have been the guy that said, I don't want you. you know, so she, this is a woman that is really uh, rejected and um, mistreated. And uh, by the way, just as, a, you know, as we see to show us how we are as humans, like today, it's, there's something similar. Like, uh, if you look at the Muslim, at the Muslim faith, uh, women uh, don't have rights. Um, most Muslim women don't have rights in their culture. And the Quran really doesn't uh, lead in that direction. The culture that Islam is in uh, does, uh, that women don't have rights. Uh, but it just shows you how easily we as humans uh, can, can allow our culture to guide uh, and direct us more than our religious beliefs. So that's one thing we have to be careful. And that's definitely, we see that in America, don't we? As our, we easily compromise our beliefs to suit the culture, just so we don't, we don't hurt or offend somebody um, by their lifestyle. Um, so um, we, just like Jesus, we see him going out of his way to meet this woman so he can lead her to true worship. So she obviously looked thirsty, wouldn't you say? He wanted to give her a drink because he loved her. He loves humanity so much, especially people that are mistreated in such a way. Uh, so he went out of his way, and for us, uh, we have to do the same, uh, especially uh, now in these times. Uh, I know back, um, let's say, I think it was uh, shortly before I was born, and I think it was, that was a little bit after electricity, <laughs> Uncle Jack, I think. They might have been using candles shortly before that, but it was just probably, I guess, in the 70s or so. Um, shortly before I was born, it was common to spend time with your neighbors. Does it, okay, does anybody agree with that? So the average was about two times per week that you would spend time with your neighbor. Not just, you know, hey, how you doing? But sitting down, uh, visiting, you know, uh, having a drink together, whatever, uh, whatever you do. Um, but you would spend time with your neighbor. That's the average was two times a week. Uh, I think things have changed a little bit. I mean, not even just in the, how the houses are built, right? We used to have porches, right, in the front, um, and you just people walk by the house and you talk to them. Um, but now it's driving to the dr- into the garage, right? Uh, or if you have if you can't park in the garage, you sneak, you know, through the front door. Hopefully, you know, you get the the brown bag grocery so you can hide your face. You know, so your neighbor doesn't see you, so you have to make eye contact with them. Things have changed. And so we have to be even more, uh, more uh, people of initiative uh, to, to initiate conversations, just like, I mean, Jesus did with this woman. But we have to do even more so, uh, I think, because uh, we're, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle at the moment. Um, if we really want to see the lost found, and the thirsty to come to the living water, we're going to have to make, we're going to have to initiate. We're going to have to go out of our way um, to start a conversation with our neighbors or with anyone, uh, for, that, for that matter. Um, 
I love, what I love about this story is how Jesus, the way he leads her uh, to the water, to the living water, uh, is such a, a peculiar way. Uh, so, so what happens is, you know, he starts a conversation, uh, and she talks about, um, well, first she says, well, um, I don't have any, you don't have a, where's your bucket? You know, he, so he offers her living water. He's like, and he says to her, well, if you knew who it was that asked you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. And she says, what are you, crazy man? What are you, what are you talking about? You have nothing to draw with. Uh, you have no pail. Uh, where are you going to get this water from? And this well over here is certainly deep. She knows. She's, she's drawn from it. Um, so that's how it starts off. And this is kind of where the invitation begins. Jesus says, go call your husband and then come back. So in a way he was, I like to think that he was just almost, he had a, like a, a water pail behind him. And as he said it, you know, go call your husband and come back. And that led the conversation to where she said, well, I don't have a husband. And then he reveals who he really is. He just says, well, yeah, you don't have a husband right now, but um, you've had five husbands. And the one you have right now is, he's not your husband. You might be, you might be living together with him, uh, but he's not your husband. And so that, she immediately tries to divert that conversation uh, because none of us, right, none of us want to be called out for our sin, right? We don't like it. Whether it's uh, God or another person, whoever it is, calling us out, we get uncomfortable, right? And we get defensive. Um, so she divi- diverts the conversation from there. Um, and, but that is the way that Jesus leads her uh, to the living water. And he goes even deeper <laughs> It's funny because he goes deeper than she even thought. She thought that well was deep. Well, he got real deep uh, with that with, with that conversation. Um, so what happens is she uh, she diverts that conversation um, and it comes to a realization that she is broken. She she doesn't say that, um, but she sees uh, that she's a sinner and. If we read, uh, John, let me read again, 21 through 24. Um, It's like, I think she's kind of asking a question. It's not so much, I mean, she started the diversion, of course, to talk about worship and talk about Mount Gerizim, that our ancestors worshiped here uh, and so forth. Um, But it actually leads right where Jesus wants her, the conversation, uh, to go. And so I, I think she's actually, she's wanting to know how, how to get to God. I mean, she's, she's saying, okay, you Jews say it's Jerusalem. We worship here. This is where our ancestors worshiped. You know, I think she's really, she wants to know. That's what I think. Um, so it's John 4, 21 uh, through 24. It's women, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming, and I love this, it says, when you. It doesn't say when you Samaritans. He speaks life. He speaks hope right into her life right there. Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship. When you will worship the Father, uh, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, speaking of the Jews. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and it has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I believe that reply uh, was a, a breath of fresh air uh, to this woman. Or maybe you would say a cup of cold water or living water uh, to her. Uh, because we see uh, after the, when the stories are stories over later in the chapter, uh, we see that this woman actually goes. It seems like she must, she must have drank the water. She must have repented. That was what it was. She needed to repent. First, she needed to know there was hope, that she could actually change, that she could actually find God and meet God 
And it doesn't depend on her past, and it doesn't depend on where she worships, what church she worshiped on, what temple. That doesn't make a difference. Jesus said, he's spirit. You can worship in the spirit and the truth. It doesn't matter what mountain uh, you're on, what building you're in. So she had hope. That was the first thing. So she got hope. She said, I can. I can actually come to worship God, and I can actually come and confess my sins. And as a Jew, as a Samaritan, she would know about having to make a sacrifice. What temple do I go to? And so this was good news that she can actually go make a sacrifice for her sins, not uh, as Jesus can, but as she was uh, to do as a good Jew. So she had hope, and she found out, and she's speaking to Jesus, who she finds out is a prophet, because he knows everything about her life. Um, so we see she goes to the town, uh, to Samaria, and tells everyone, and leads people to faith. So obviously, she must have had some living water. She repented, and she came to a knowledge of the truth. She, her thirst had, had been quenched. And much like every other Christian, she had two revelations. We all have two revelations. First, a revelation of who God really is in truth, of who God, who Jesus really is. That's the first revelation. And then the second one is who we are, who we are without God, who we are in our sins, who we are in, in need of a Savior. She had the, both those revelations, and she was set free, and she was, her thirst uh, was quenched. Now, looking at uh, the Samaritans and how how they worship. Jesus said here, and this, you might be kind of confused when, I, I know I get confused when I read this, like, you Samaritans don't, you worship what you do not know. Like, okay, what's up with that? Um, well, if you notice, um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you study Samaritan worship or just Samaritan lifestyles and their faith, uh, they held only to the first five books of the Bible. Uh, they had, you know, they could have had the, the whole Old Testament, uh, but they just held to the first five books, the Pentateuch, uh, they left out, you know, they, 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 chose, they, they chose not to uh, view anything else as scripture. And so they didn't use, they, they, they're missing the prophets, uh, like Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Uh, they're, they're missing uh, the books of wisdom, right? Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, Proverbs. And there's one big one about worship. What, do you th- what, what would it be? Yeah, Psalms. That's a big deal when it comes to directing your worship, especially as a, uh, as a, uh, for corporate worship, uh, the Psalms and privately, but uh, we use a lot of the, we, we get a lot of our worship songs now because of the Psalms. And so they didn't have that. So Jesus says, yeah, you're worshiping what you do not know. You don't know God to the fullest. You're, you're missing out a whole lot of what has been revealed in his word. And not only that, they also most likely were just following Yahweh because out of fear and superstition. Second Kings 17 says, uh, says how they, when they came in, they, they brought their gods and they included Yahweh with, their, with their, their other worship. So as you see, it's like, oh, well, well we don't want to miss Yahweh. That's the God. I mean, we kind of know about him. We better, we better include him or something bad might happen, right? Um, so they were also in ignorance where they didn't, um, I mean, they, they, were, they were misled on how that Yahweh is to be above everything else. And he is not to be someone that is, you know, added to, to our life. He is to be it. Jesus is not something added to my lifestyle. Uh, I, that's why I brought this up here. I want to kind of show how bad I can draw, actually. But hopefully show what's going on in my mind here. Uh, I had a teacher that first did this to me. And it really, uh, it really opened my eyes up. So this is kind of a circle. Is that all right? Can you see back there, Kira? You can take a picture. <laughs> so uh, this is a pie chart of our lives, right? And I want you to imagine just if you were doing this for yourself. But let's say uh, normally what we do, let's say like there's certain sections like, okay, this section, you know, say if you're a student, uh, this, is, this, is, this is school right here. Now, just imagine this is school. If you, if you could. All right. And let's say, all right, yeah, yeah, it might be more than that. But you're sleep in there, right? <laughs> so you got to, you know, you got sleep, right? <laughs> no? That's uh, wishful thinking. That's what that is. Uh, I don't know. This doesn't have to be perfect, all right? 
Uh, okay, good. Anybody want to name some? Work. Parts of your life. Work. Work. How far am I going on this one? Okay, we'll get right there. Work. We'll do homework. Just kind of, kind of attached to that one. That'll be homework over there. Huh? TV. Yeah, that's a good one. TV. <clears throat> Social media. Yeah, I'll just put Facebook, whatever. Because not everybody uses Twitter here. Probably everybody uses Facebook, mostly, or at least did one time. All right. <laughs> there you go, David. <laughs> All right. Um, maybe, should we put worship in here? Yeah. Maybe worship. Worship in God, maybe it's the same. So how much should we, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to point anybody out here. A typical person, what, what would you put? Here, just leave the rest or what? Huh? Like this? Yeah. All right, so I, I just want to share this. Like, okay, we, we kind of separate things out like that. And, uh, yeah, see, we have God in this portion or maybe this portion. Um, as if someone added, just added to our life. But really, what is it supposed to be? The whole circle. The whole, th- the whole thing is to be worship and God. Everything we do. It's all our homework, our f- Facebook, TV, sleep, school, whatever it is. What do we, our times of play. Um, they're all to be guided by the one. By the, the one whose our full devotion and attention is to. And when you get there, when you're, when, when you're letting him guide everything... Yeah, you're not going to have that spiritual thirst. You're not going to be like those people I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon uh, that are in, you see in deep depravity. Uh, we got to understand that he is to be a part of and guide every part of our lives. Uh, we can't be uh, selective. Uh, looking at, so the Samaritans, that we saw they selected certain false worship. What it does is it's at first ignorant. The false worship also is selective where you pick and choose, uh, for example, what parts of the Bible I like uh, and I'll follow these ones, especially ones that, are, that I don't have, let's say, struggle with in that certain area. Uh, I'll pick that one. Um, but the other ones, uh, yeah, I don't like this, not too good this. Um, so we can't, we can't pick and choose uh, the Bible in, in God's way and how, how we're going to worship him with our lives. Um, if we do that, yes, we're going to be thirsty. Uh, a lot, I think a lot of times we do, we kind of, like I said, we substitute God for things and expect uh, more, we, we expect that eternal life. We expect the abundant life and to have that spiritual thirst quenched, but uh, it's not going to happen because cause those things can't come through as God does. He's the only one that can fully satisfy us and give us a true uh, meaning of what life is all about. Now, Jesus, now I'm not going to end just on false worship, worship, but let's look at what true worship is. True worship is guided by truth. Jesus said you must worship, the spirit, worship in spirit and in truth as revealed in God's word, who is the very, Jesus was the very embodiment of truth. And so we need to be guided by the truth of God as revealed in scripture. And then uh, he says in, in the spirit. Now, you might think, hey, this, this is guided by the Holy, the Holy Spirit. But um, it's certainly true. Our worship and our lives would be guided by the Holy, the Holy Spirit. But he says God is Spirit. It doesn't say God is Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. He is God. But it says God is Spirit. And David said also, also in the Psalms, he says, where can I go from your Spirit, right? From your presence. God he says he is Spirit. He's not flesh. He says God is Spirit. And uh, he's not limited to, to the physical, to the tangible. Uh, and the things that we give, like when we're, when we're truly worshiping God in Spirit, our deepest things that are not tangible, the greatest, highest form of worship is going to be intangible. Yeah, we can give things to God in, a, in an act of worship, but the greatest worship, which should guide the rest, is our love, our devotion, our who has your loyalty? Who, who has your loyalty? Who, who do you obey? Now, if you obey God, you love God, you're loyal to him, that's your, you're worshiping him in, in spirit. That's a non-tangible thing in the highest form, having a friendship and an intimacy 
uh, with him. And that will guide uh, all the rest. And as St. Augustine said, Doug, I might have to have you uh, finish this one for me. Love God. Yes, thank you. Love God and do what you please. Now, you know, at first glance, you say, oh, that's a license to sin. Because God, I love God and that, that covers all my sins. Uh, no. Uh, what Augustine is talking about is if we love God, the things that please us will be the things that please God. We will want to honor him. If we love him, if we're worshiping in, in full spirit and in truth with all the intangibles and loving him and fully devoted to him, that'll guide it all. And that'll be your greatest safeguard against those temptations uh, that, that, can't, that can't produce what God produces. That'll be your greatest safeguard against, against sin is a satisfied heart that is satisfied in him. Well, let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you for quenching our thirst, our spiritual thirst. And God, we, we confess uh, we have strayed away from you. We stray away from you like sheep going astray often. Uh, but you call us back to yourself, God. Help us to come to you, to come to the living waters, to come to the well of living water, to Jesus, and let him uh, quench our thirst and be our guide, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.